You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. Welcome to the Options Playbook, the program where we break down cutting-edge option strategies and explain how you can incorporate them into your own portfolio. Whether you're looking to grow your capital with some offensive maneuvers or protect your investments with defensive plays, you can find them all in the Options Playbook. The Options Playbook is brought to you by Ally Invest. Anything mentioned today is for educational purposes and is not a recommendation or advice. Options involve risk. Please refer to ally.com slash invest slash disclosures to review additional risks involved with trading options. Securities offered through Ally Invest Securities, LLC, member FINRA, and SIPC. Now, let's open the playbook and get started. All right, everybody, that music means it is time once again for Options Playbook Radio, the program here on the network where we break down all of the many and varied options plays. You got some offensive plays. You want to go out and speculate, maybe get yourself some income. You get defensive plays. You want to protect what you got or a lot of plays that maybe maybe go fall a little bit in between, get a little bit more crazy out there. Of course, you can find it all here. On Options Playbook Radio, my name is Mark Longo from theoptionsinsider.com. As well as, of course, from the ever-exciting Options Insider Radio Network. Got a fun treat for all of you out there in the Secret Club today. You can join us live for a very rare, very rare live huddle episode. Yes, we dragged Mr. Overby kicking and screaming back to the live to answer your questions. I'm joking. He loves to do it. Of course, I'm talking about the options guy himself. Mr. Brian Overby from Ally Invest. Mr. Overby, welcome back to your own program, sir. Are you excited to engage with the masses yet again? Yes, definitely excited. We got a volatile month. If you're an option trader, volatility shouldn't scare you. It also makes it much more interesting to do a lot of different trades overall. And a few of the questions that we got come in, deal with volatility and butterflies to try to give you a little hint of it as to what's coming up. So I love it when we get together, Mark, and we can huddle up. It's time to huddle up and answer questions about your favorite options plays. Submit your questions via twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, or questions at the options insider.com. All right, everybody. It is time to huddle up. Like the man said, it's a portion of the show. You guys are always sending in questions to the show, and it's always fun when Brian and I can grab a few minutes and sit down and try to answer a whole bunch of them. You mentioned butterflies. That may be our code word, our theme for the episode today, Brian. What do you think? <laughs> yes, definitely. Uh, butterflies are always interesting in volatile markets. You're luring people to the dark side of butterflies, Brian. You and all your skip strike flies out there. You're, you're getting people <laughs> hooked. So let's see what they have on their brain. All right, first up, we actually have a couple of related questions. So let's let's put these together. First, we have Nico. Nico says, loving all the OPR. I've been binging for months now. Well, you're not alone there, Nico. A lot of folks have been uh, discovering OPR in the last oh, year and change out there, especially you're right in the last six or so months. A lot of new people trading options, a lot of new people listening to OPR. So welcome to you, Nico, and everybody else. 
who's been joining the team out there. Glad you're enjoying the binging. <laughs> he says, Brian, oh, here we go. Brian has turned me into a butterfly trader as a result of this show. See, I told you, Brian, you learn folks uh, to the dark side. He says, one thing I wish he could address in more detail is the best practices for taking butterflies off because it's rare that you have a fly close at exactly your short strike. He has touched on various aspects of this in the past, but I think it might be worth a deeper dive since clearly so many people are starting to embrace this style of trading. Thanks so much, Brian, for all that you do. And thanks to OIRL. Thanks to us. Thanks to the network for putting out so much great content for us options traders, (laughs) options insider radio network for life. Well, thank you. And if you want to get that tattooed on your arm, Nico, feel free. Send us pictures and then you can be a member for life. That That's worth it for a tattoo, I think. <laughs> but thank you for that sentiment nonetheless. I am joking. Don't, don't mar your flesh with us unless you really are motivated. Then, hey, send us a picture. <laughs> and then uh, we have a similar question here from Mikey. Mikey wants to know, is Brian planning to add a section for butterfly spreads under the managing positions section of optionsplaybook.com? Thank you for your show. So, Brian, people have butterflies on the brain, in particular – the post trade aspect, you know, the managing, adjusting, and taking them off. So maybe we'll do the second one first because it's easier. Are you going to add that section and then be maybe in more detail about how you like to take off your flies for Nico, sir? All right. So there's no plans at this point in time to uh, to, to actually add anything to the options playbook at at this moment. Um, if we did, it would be a full new book and then we would maybe talk more about the managing section. Um, that's one of the hardest sections to write. And the biggest reason why is that you never know what the exact situation is going to be. Uh, you try to address it. You try to say, this is what I want to do, but there's not a golden book of, of answers as to how to manage this one particular trade with the market in this pricing conditions. So it's always tough overall. Um, Whenever I can be general about managing positions, like I was inside the options playbook about covered calls, uh, there's just a simple thing. You know, ideally, if you want to roll a covered call option, you don't want it to get too far in the money. You don't want it to get away from you. You can't really roll it. So there are general things that you can do about managing a position. But with the butterfly in general, The best thing about managing the position, ideally, is picking your expiration. When you're first putting that position on, it's very important based off of the underlying and what you expect to happen, um, how much time premium can come out over the life of the trade. And if you're correct or incorrect on your trade, what happens to time decay? What happens to gamma as it's driving delta? towards that short strike. Because the biggest thing about a butterfly overall is that you're selling two at the money option contracts. And if you are correct on your forecast, you need that time premium to go away. So I usually err to the side, which is kind of different with options overall, of being too short on the time frame as opposed to going too far out in time. And that's kind of where the skip strike comes in, in that if I do a skip strike butterfly, which I think we're going to be talking about on next week's show, actually, um, if I do a skip strike butterfly, what I'm saying is I don't have to be as worried about the time. If I'm targeting an out of the money uh, uh, situation on the put side or on the call side, and I'm incorrect on my forecast, if I get it done for a net credit, well, oh, well, I didn't make a lot, but at least I didn't lose a ton on that trade. So that's why I lean towards skip strike butterflies. But now if I want to get out of a trade and I put the trade on, here's a general rule that I can give for managing a position. If I have bought too much time, and the underlying stock has came up and hit my short strike on my standard butterfly. And I think, oh my gosh, I should have made a dollar on this trade, but I only made 50 cents. Guess what? Get out. Just get out of that trade overall. You erred because you gave too much time to the butterfly, which usually you kind of like that scenario, but you need those two short options to decay 
And it's only going to happen close to expiration or if you get a big drop in implied volatility. And you know when that may happen is around known news events like earnings, stuff like that, where it can help you out on your trade. So butterflies are interesting in this market environment because when vols are high in general in indexes and in stocks, butterflies are cheaper to put on. Initially, they're cheaper. So if you put them on and you're correct on your forecast, you want implied volatility to come down. It's another reason why when I talk a lot about skip strike butterflies, it doesn't have anything to do with the underlying, but I would prefer to do them on the upside as opposed to the downside. So target an upside target. And the main reason why is that if I am correct on my forecast, implied volatility in general usually comes down when markets go up. So there's there's some method to the madness on skip strike butterflies and also on just straight out butterflies. The last comment that I would make to try to... Uh, uh, make Nico happy for such a great question, such a great accolades that he, that he gave us, Mark, overall, um, is that don't expect a home run. If, I, if I'm doing a five-point wide butterfly and I paid a dollar for it, if I can make, if I can sell that butterfly for $2, that's a really good trade. So don't expect to put a $1 butterfly on and sell it for $3. That's a hard trade to pull off, but if I'm doing that and I'm expecting that type of return, that means I'm doing like a one-day or two-day butterfly, right? Because the only way that I'm going to really get that rate of decay, if I'm correct on my forecast, is if I do it in a shorter time frame overall. So great question. Um, I basically, I think, I, I think that with that answer, Mark, I think we can almost leave right now. Right. Cause I think that just summed up everything. There you go. From we're all, we're all done. Radio. No other questions could possibly be on the horizon, <laughs> but I'm totally with you about time frame and time horizon when it comes to butterflies. Cause I get it. People write into us all the time. You know, it's so tempting. You mentioned like buying a fly for a buck. They may be able to get up maybe a whole extra month for not much more than that. And it's tempting. Why well, I'll get two months instead of one, you know? And then of course, you're right. You don't. You need that time for that short leg to come in on the long fly side. And sometimes people buy too much time and it ends up working against them. And it's strange to say that because people always say, oh, you know, get as much time as you can. And options have the ticking clock factor and you want to put that off as long as you possible. But when it comes to flies, there's so many timing elements that have to work out. And if you have too much time, you get the move and then it comes back down again. And you're not going to capture it if you still have a lot of time left in that fly. It's just the way flies work. Speaking of flies, Brian, really quick, I looked out right now because our question of the week right now is on the on the old Twitters. You guys can vote at options if you haven't done so already. We said there are many misperceptions about options. However, some strategies seem to cause more problems than others. Quite simply, what is the most misunderstood option strategy? We gave you three choices and then the you know, proverbial other, and you guys have sent in a litany of other suggestions, including, you know, box spreads and all kinds of crazy stuff. But uh, we gave you time spreads, straddles slash triangles, because they're kind of in the same box there, and butterflies. And right now, butterflies are number two, Brian, with exactly 25%. Uh, the number one kind of running away with it right now is time spreads, 52.5%. Straddles and strangles bringing up the rear at 17.5% and other with 5%. Are you surprised or perhaps is that what you expected that butterflies would come in there at number two, sir? Oh, I, no, I like the butterflies coming in number two. And as a matter of fact, the time spread, if you look at the profit and loss graph and you're looking at an at the money butterfly and a profit and loss graph and an at the money time spread, uh, they're very similar. Actually, um, the time spread is kind of, some people will say is the poor man's butterfly. Uh, the one thing about a time spread is that it just adds so many complexities into the into the strategy when you're dealing with two expirations. Um, if you put a time spread on. And you, you, you definitely don't want to fall asleep at that first expiration. Um, uh, you have to trade time spreads uh, much. You have to be, pay much more attention on a time spread than any other strategy and options. And it's one of the hardest strategies to teach overall. There's just no real good way to, to address uh, actually like a, if you do a, a long call time spread, the fact that you want implied volatility to go up. Um, overall, you want the back month vol to be higher because when it's all said and done, if I am short a call and long a call at the first expiration, 
that first option contract goes away, you're just long a call option. And then you want increased implied volatility. Those concepts are tough. So yes, I would definitely pick time spreads. And, and butterflies, I think the, the, the confusion, the reason why that one would come in second is exactly what we talked about, is the fact that you're selling two at the money option contracts and you've got to get that expiration right or it's hard to um, hit it out of the park, if you will, for lack of a better term, uh, on a butterfly trade overall. All right, let's keep on rolling here. Dan T., one of our Secret Club members, sent this one in. He says, my question is, are in-the-money puts worth buying And how do they work in contrast to at the money or out of the money puts? I use portfolio margin. So buying the puts significantly adds buying power to my account because I'm at least guaranteeing that I won't lose capital on the trade. Any feedback is welcome. As I recall from Dan's other question, he likes to, he likes to hedge his positions pretty aggressively, like buying pretty meaty puts against his at the money options and his stocks and things. So what are your thoughts? We haven't really talked about, we talked about hedging with your traditional out of the money puts and out of the money flies. What are your thoughts, though, Brian, about going in the money, in the money puts? Are you a fan, yay or nay, sir? As a, as a 100% hedge, uh, I mean, or basically just using them as a hedge. Haven't given a lot of thought to it. It's not very common to do. Obviously, it's expensive. And if you're buying an in the money put, you're more bearish uh, than you may think you are, right? Because you're paying up for that put. And if the market does go up, which ideally that's what you want when you're buying a married put or a protective put, then uh, you got to it's got to go up way more. You know, in other words, it's got to cover that total cost of that in the money put option. So overall, I, I, I guess for the first time answering a question like this, which I've been doing this for 20 some years, I've never really had this proposed to me to be blunt about it. Um, it does affect his margin, though, because he's doing portfolio margin. So it's fixating a sell price a little bit higher. And I think maybe that's where this is coming from, because um, that, that would help having a higher sell price than a lower sell price on portfolio margining. I don't think I'm a big fan, because ideally, if I'm doing the puts and I'm doing it as protection, and I'm paying a lot for them, you might want to just consider selling the stock. But I think in this one instance from Dan T, I, I understand it because of the portfolio margining. And that would be an o- one of the only times I could see uh, using this as a hedge. Yeah, I'm with I you. had to really think about that one. I'm, I'm not a huge fan. of. He's effectively neutering his existing positions in order to be able to put on more positions. That's kind of what he's doing. And I, yeah. Yeah, I'm not a huge fan of that. If you have these positions on for a reason, you want to get some bang for the buck. Just because you can do another position doesn't mean maybe you should. Maybe you should keep the ones you have and see how those work before you buy some really expensive in the money put and and kill a lot of the of the potential of that position just so you could free up some capital and go do something else. I I, I get the sentiment, but yeah, I'm definitely not not a huge fan of it. Like Brian expressed there. Right, let's go on to this one. This one went directly to you, Brian. This came from Thomas Byrne. He says, I kind of understand, or I should say I understand enough to keep moving. Basically, the VIX has a futures component and futures have an expiration. I have a couple of more front burner questions, one very big picture and one day to day. Big picture, I don't understand how volatility gets priced into an option. A big problem with a lot of explanations is that they revert to primary school options trading. What I really want to know is when does it get priced in? And most importantly, who does it? (laughs) Makes sense. for So, for example, let's say I go to the SIBO website and there is info there about volatility. Who controls this information? How does it end up in in the option? If it's the market, then how does the market know, for example, when the earnings dates are? Who plugs this in? Are we saying that the market controls the vol? And when the earnings dates are confirmed, for example, Apple, then the vol shoots up. I haven't seen the vol work like that. I don't get it. Who prices the vol into the options? And he has an addendum. Usually you limit you to one, but we'll be nice. We'll have him at a second one. He says, secondly, on a day-to-day basis, I sell out-of-the-money calls. How come when I sell out-of-the-money puts, it's a debit to my account and not a credit? Uh, thank you, Tom from Colorado. So, Mr. Brian, a couple of many varied questions baked in here. Sounds like he's coming to grips with trading options on VIX and the fact that there is a future as opposed to a stock there, which for a lot of people 
that is a confusing thing. But he's more confused, it sounds like, about where Vol comes in on the whole options pricing spectrum. Who does that? Who's the man behind the curtain who pulls the lever there, Brian? And then if you want to also do a second one here about uh, the debits and credits of selling all the money calls versus puts, have at it, sir. All right. All right. Um, in general, uh, I, I, I remember this question because Thomas actually, actually sent me an email. Um, and to, to deal with the VIX, uh, a lot of people just have that, that concept is tough. Um, if you're trading the VIX, it's like trading options on the weather. Um, you never really know. The fact that the VIX runs up today doesn't mean that the VIX is going to be somewhere tomorrow. It's a mean reverting index. So if I was a market maker, the VIX as a stock, if you could just buy VIX, put in that ticker symbol and say, I want to buy 100 shares of it, I would never want to make a market in that. And the main reason why is that it's a mean reverting index. It's not an underlying stock. We even know with all the downturns in the marketplaces that we've ever had, all the big downturns, and we've seen the VIX go to 80, 100, 40, 20, 30, we know eventually the VIX is going to go below 20. It just eventually is going to happen. So making markets in, an, in something that's mean reverting like that is extremely tough to do. Bid ask spreads would be really wide. So it's just really not going to happen. Okay. So. Let's go in and talk about volatility. Now, this is a chicken or the egg scenario. There's no great explanation. I've explained it many, many different ways. One of the ways, if you do have a sports betting mind, is to think about the line on maybe a football game. We're in a football season. I'm a Green Bay Packer fan, and I think that Mark is a Chicago Bears fan. So if the Packers were playing the Bears, they'd probably be favored by like 10 points, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, maybe three, kind of a, maybe one. A little bit of a dig. <laughs> I'm sorry, did I hit the hang up button? How did that happen, sir? <laughs> so overall, when you ask about that volatility component in your option contract, it'd be the same thing as saying, why are the Packers favored by 10 points? It's the exact kind of question and answer. There's no real good reason as to why it is, but the money flows are saying as it comes in, Everybody thinks, oh, the Packers are going to win. We're going to start betting. We're going to bet it up. And all of a sudden, the line in Vegas is getting too heavy on the Packers side. So they say, all right, we need to increase the line and make the Packers now minus 11. Why? Because they need some money to come in down on the bear side of it to try to offset their risk. Because in Vegas, they don't want to, to, to root for one team or the other team in general. They just want to take the, the, the VIG. They want to take uh, the, the difference uh, between, or I'm sorry, the VIG that you have to pay if you, if you lose that bet overall. So we're in the options marketplace. Now, this is, once again, there's just so many ways that you try to explain this. But now you're talking about money flow. So does the implied volatility does that number drive the price or does the price drive the implied volatility? And there is a little of both. Now, if I'm a market maker on the trading floor, I might think that my implied volatility uh, uh, model is better than the, than the person that is standing next to me. And because of that, um, I think vols are high. So I'm a seller and that person might think vols are low. So they're a buyer overall. But that's where the real complexity comes in is with the market making firms that are making actual markets who have no control if they're buying or selling because they're just trading the order flow. And they're trying to get that implied volatility right. On our end, we're, we're, we're picking which way we want the market to go. So we're either buying a call because we think it's going up or we're buying a put because we're thinking it's going down. Those money flows affect that implied volatility overall in the marketplace. And then when we go to sell an option contract around earnings, that also affects it. It's all about how the money flows are coming in and out. Market makers are trying to control it. And the only way that I can really think for somebody that's struggling with this concept is that it really applies to the same thing as gambling on a football game overall. Now, now I do have to say that this is not meant to be a, a recommendation or anything to go along with that. This scenario is just to try to explain what actually happens in, in the market-making world. 
And this question of the chicken or egg, what comes first, volatility or price? The answer really is both. And even even more so when you get to the shorter term option contracts, models break down. They don't really work. What what do you want to buy this option contract? Well, I'll sell it to you. I have no. What are you willing to pay? Oh, now you're willing to pay that. OK, that's what I'm selling it to you for. And the only way that you can adjust and account for that is moving that volatility overall. And I know Mark has been on the floor for many years and uh, has concepts on it. But, Mark, I don't know of a better way than talking about you know, a line in a football game. I mean, because it, it's very true on both scenarios. Yeah, the line is an apt analogy. By the way, our producer is much more of a diehard Bears fan than I. Uh, just informed me that Justin Fields is now the starting quarterback. So she thinks that line is even money now, sir. So you may, <laughs> you may be in trouble up there in the pack, but I digress. But I think the, uh, the line for sports betting is an apt analogy because it's a similar process. You know, the market makers are going out there. They have models that are going to run, and they've obviously gotten much more sophisticated in recent years, even back when I was on the floor. They try to estimate things like you're asking about. Like, they don't know the earnings data ahead of time, but they will try to estimate that. There are services out there like Wall Street Horizon and other that try to provide a lot of data to these market makers so how they can inform their estimates of when they think the earnings event will be. And forget about going to the SIBO website and reading about volatility. Where you want to go is to the options chain. And those are available everywhere on all of your broker. That's the volatility information that matters, not the whatever explanatory stuff you're reading on SIBO or any other website out there. That's all whatever. It, the options chain is the real data and the information that matters. And then they're going to have their estimate of what they think fair volatility level is. The beautiful thing about volatility, really, when it comes to options pricing, is that it's just a huge fudge factor at the end of the day. If the market makers are wrong, if the customers think that estimate is too low, guess what? They're going to buy it, and that vol is going to increase, and it's just going to dial up the volatility in that contract. Look at upside calls in any quote-unquote meme stock coming into the beginning of this year. They were all priced clearly too low because folks gobbled those up like they were going out of style. So what happened? The upside volatility in those call wings got jacked to high heaven. And market makers adjusted, and that's what they do, and that's what the lines in Vegas do. They move to address the action and where the customers want to be. So they will have some best estimate when they first list that contract. And you're right, if there is some sort of all of a sudden there's information, there's a concrete date here for earnings that may adjust a little bit with the contracts, but usually they'll have enough priced in in the contracts around that in case there is some sort of wiggle room with that. But generally, that's not going to be too much of a of a surprise as to the actual day of a big name like Apple, people are going to have that pretty dialed in. But in general, yeah, they have that their best estimate, and then they, it goes and interacts with the order flow out there, and vol will go up if customers think it's too cheap, and vol will come crashing in if they think it's too expensive. And that's basically how it works. And sometimes it ebbs and flows intra week. Look at long holiday weekends. You know, the question everyone asks then is, when are people going to take the volatility out? When is that going to come out? When's it going to take the weekend out? You know, and that could happen early in the week. If it's a quiet week, it could happen right before expiration or right before close on the Friday if it's a very busy week. So there's no real hard and fast rule book for how this stuff plays out. But in general, that's uh, pretty much how it is. We can talk about this for a while. We got a bunch more coming in. Let's go to this one really quickly. Let's go to my AG. My AG says, what is the cheapest stock price that you would consider trading an option on, Brian? So, Brian, I know in... It was old school for a long time. A lot of old school guys wouldn't even touch an option on a stock, let's say, below $10. I know our buddy, you know, Alex Jacobson, who was on the network many times. He, if it got below 10 bucks, you forget about it. He was out. But what, what about you, Brian? What is your line of demarcation? Or perhaps is there one? Maybe, maybe it's evolved in, in recent days, given what we're seeing out there, sir. Uh, my answer would be Ford. <laughs> uh, Ford is about the lowest price stock that I buy options. So wherever Ford is, that, that's your cutoff. I like that. Okay, that's my that. cutoff because Ford is a very interesting underlying in that it has a lot. It has very good volume. Has very good option markets. Um, I really don't want to go below because, and when I say cheapest stock, that implies that the that the stock overall is just cheap. Um, I'd, I've never thought of Ford that way. I mean, we saw Bank of America get down below $10 uh, in, in, in the big downturn in 2008. Um, but those low price stocks like that, um, if if they're not a known name, if they don't have volatility, the bid ask spreads just get a little bit wide on them. And also you're looking at if you're paying those wide bid ask spreads on those low price stocks overall, uh, that's my biggest concern about buying options on cheap price stocks. Why not just buy the stock, right? It, all, it, it ideally is an option, right? If I got a $5 
stock that's trading at that price, I would just rather deal with the stock and not deal with implied volatility, not deal with time decay. If I'm right on my forecast, I'm right. If I'm wrong or if I want to get short, I get short. Um, that is the way that I would approach it overall. But uh, yeah, Ford is nowadays is about the, the line in the sand. Um, and not only because of the price of the stock, it's mainly because of the liquidity of the stock overall, because that's what scares me the most about cheap price stocks and options that trade on them. That's funny. I didn't expect you to say Ford. I like that. So that's a new answer for that question. Ford, wherever <laughs> Ford is, which I think is around 14 bucks right now. That's, that's the right. cutoff that far and no farther. I like that. That's, that's funny. I'll just keep on rolling and see if we can squeeze a few more in because the people love getting at us here, Brian. Speaking of people, unfortunately, we clearly have some Packers fans in our live chat. So that just shows, Brian, there's no accounting for taste. Even amongst our very <laughs> intelligent and discerning audience, there still are some Packers fans out there. So I'm sure our producers will do their best to uh, to ban them from the chat for life. But as we keep on rolling here, let's go to uh, Durzo. Durzo has a very simple question. He says, good afternoon. I love how polite our audience is. Well, good afternoon to you, Durzo. He says, would you recommend for me to start learning to trade options using a paper trading account? Thank you. Well, Brian, I think I know your answer to this one because you recommend them all the time. But what do you have to say here for Durzo and paper trading accounts, sir? Uh, the, yes, without a doubt, paper trading accounts are, are a great way to start. You got to keep on top of them. The biggest problem about a paper trading account when you're using options marketplace, and it's a big, it's a problem just in the marketplace overall, is you, you, you don't necessarily know where you're going to fill. Right. And in the options marketplace, uh, 50 cent wide spread is normal uh, relative to a stock world where that would be a ginormous bid ask spread. So knowing exactly where you would fill uh, a lot of times just kind of work off the midpoint. And that's what I do in options playbook radio. I always you know, let people know that the midpoint is no guarantee by any means, but I don't really know how to address that issue in a paper trading account. So watch it, see what happens to the price, definitely, uh, and then start small. Um, I, I like, as a, as a beginning trader, I like to see strategies like a covered call where you own a stock and you wouldn't mind selling the stock at a higher price because um, a lot of people that start trading options at least, uh, well, when I worked at Chicago Board Option Exchange, we found out that pe most people would trade stocks for at least five years before they would trade options. I think that number has changed a little bit since back in the day. But with that said, um, if you own a stock and you sell a call against it, you get focused on watching the option contract move and the price of the option contract. And that's where I think people err the most when they first start trading options is they don't have a realistic expectation as to what, how your option price will move relative to movements in the stock price. So selling a call on a stock that you don't mind selling at a higher price, it's really hard to get hurt on that trade. Right. I mean, obviously, if it goes down, you have the risk of the stock. But on the upside, you're just giving up some opportunity overall. So I would start with paper trading. I would look at maybe covered call writing as opposed to just buying out of the money options, which is the most common thing beginning option traders do. Yeah, I think if we redid that survey now, it'd probably be very different. Just seeing yeah. anecdotally what we're seeing for people right now, they're diving straight into options with no stock experience at all, Brian. And yeah, they're just true. going a couple of months. They're just, bam, hey, I'm slinging calls on whatever it is. AMC, Tesla, pick your poison out there. So, yeah, very different. That might be a good poll question for us coming up. Like, how did you get started trading options, right? Did you trade stocks first? Did you drive straight into options? You, that might, you, might, you may have given us some a good suggestion for a future poll question, Brian. So I, <laughs> I, I thank you for that. All right, let's keep on rolling here. Let's see if we can squeeze a few more in. Before we get on out of here, uh, back to butterflies, Brian. We are not done with butterflies. Marcus wants to know. Let me just see if I have this correct. When I buy a long butterfly position on XYZ stock, I typically want volatility to decrease so that the premium will erode and I'll get to my max payout faster. Is that correct, Brian? What say you for Marcus and his butterfly vol question, sir? That is correct if you are correct on your forecast. So, uh, if I am correct on my forecast and the underlying stock or index is going towards my short strike, I would like vol premium to erode because if I am correct, I would be buying to close 
to at the money option contracts. And that's where all the time premium is. Uh, one way we can lose time premium is implied volatility can come in on the option contracts or we have time, time decay. Now, if I'm incorrect, implied volatility helps me in that scenario. I want premiums to stay up overall. And that gives me a small little buffer um, and, and gives me a chance, right, on my butterfly overall. So uh, we had to look at both scenarios. I want to try to cover them both. But if I am if I am correct on my forecast, I want implied volatility to come in. And hence why I talk more about call side or upside butterflies than I do about put side butterflies or downside. Speaking of upside, let's go to this last one here from MKT. Maybe markets. Let's go with market. It sounds more fun. Market says, hey, Brian. Has the ape frenzy? <laughs> I love how they call themselves apes. That sounds pejorative to me, but say lobby. I guess they've embraced it. He says, "Has the ape frenzy for AMC and Game made you consider updating or adding an addendum to the playbook to discuss trading options in these insane times? Maybe a chapter on how new types of call skew have impacted strategies like covered calls and verticals." So he's not wrong, Brian. We are trading in crazy times, and some strategies do work a little bit differently in some of these names. What are your thoughts here on market suggestion? Yet another update to the playbook, sir. You got well, homework today. <laughs> yeah, I know. I have so many updates overall. No, uh, the playbook, one of the biggest things about the playbook overall is it's when you work for a brokerage firm, you have so many compliance people looking at it that uh, it's it's hard to make updates. So you can't just run in and add a couple of pages and just let it go. Uh you know, so that's one of the issues with with updating something when you work for a brokerage firm. So, and your series seven and twenty four, et cetera, et cetera. Now, the insane times. I'm going to say just one thing in general about AMC and GameStop is when we looked at the option prices, and I had a couple of, re and I've talked to a couple of reporters about this, and there's a few quotes out there um, just in general about these stocks. Is after the first run up, um, this is one time where option pricing really seem to to get it right in that uh they the market ran up and the market came off everybody uh that was a sophisticated investor and i'm using quotes on that on cnbc and all that all said see this is what happened it's over sorry that you lost your money uh, it's too bad you shouldn't have been playing it in the first place when that happened the option trading implied that that stock could come back in other words there's it implied that both AMC and G, uh, GameStop, uh, that there's still people buying way out of the money option contracts and they're, they're charging them for them and they're willing to still pay for them overall. And guess what? The market did come back and it, the volatility continued and it, and it lasted for a year as opposed to what most quote unquote experts thought it would last a month and then it would be done overall. So, the pricing of the options said that these prices were feasible. That's one way to look at it. And if they're feasible, you're going to have to pay for them. It's all about probability in the options market our marketplace. If it's probable that the underlying stock could get to that strike price, it's not going to be a free option contract overall. And uh, so I find that interesting because we've had talked a lot about pricing on, on this huddle up today. And that's a very true statement. And I actually pointed that out because we had an, uh, a meeting about underlying stocks and and just GameStop and AMC in general. And one of the things that, that I really said overall is that the, the we might think that, that this frenzy is over, but the options marketplace does not. And the options marketplace ended up being right on that one. Well, Mr. Brian, I want to thank you for taking the time out of your busy day to answer the folks' questions because they love it. I know it's hard for you to get here and do the live, but we really appreciate it. The audience appreciates everyone here, I'm sure, who wrote in, appreciates it. If they want to join up on the next huddle or perhaps pick your brain in between episodes of this fine program, Mr. Brian, where should they go? What should they do? 
Oh, if they would like to get a hold of me, one of the best places to find out about our education that we do inside the Ally Invest, uh, inside the Ally Invest network and on the YouTube channel, the Ally YouTube channel is to just follow me on Twitter. My handle is very simple. It's my name at Brian Overby. And then also you can email me at the options guy at invest.ally.com. Uh, thanks for listening, everyone. Mark, thanks for hosting. And we will see you same time, same place next week. Thanks for coming, everyone. The Options Playbook is brought to you by Ally Invest. Anything mentioned today is for educational purposes and is not a recommendation or advice. Options involve risk. Please refer to ally.com slash invest slash disclosures to review additional risks involved with trading options. Securities offered through Ally Invest Securities, LLC, member FINRA and SIPC. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available in the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com.